All right, guys, uh, as promised, you have a recording for this Monday. We're going to pick back up with the progressive accomplishments that we started on Friday. Just a reminder of the assignments that you have due this week because there's quite a few. You have your Journal 17. You have the Progressive President's documents. There's about 10 documents there. Remember, you can write in, you should be writing in complete sentences if you want to turn in a separate document with your responses on it because there isn't enough room. That's also okay. Make sure uh, you're highlighting the evidence in each document that you're basing your answer off of. Your short paper is also due this Friday. And your test we have next week on the 31st. Okay, so we discussed the beginnings of the progressive accomplishments on Friday with the political reform that was happening to increase civic participation. Uh, at the state level, there's going to be continued reform in order to continue to expand on the voice of the voter. One of the examples that we point to during this time is with Robert LaFollette. Uh, he is going to be out of Wisconsin and he will push to really reform the direct primary within the state of Wisconsin and its ultimate success in cleaning up those political machines and the corruption that we saw at that state level through the direct primary gets Wisconsin the nickname of the Laboratory of Democracy. This actual testing of what will it look like if we give the people more of a voice in the democratic process. And in its success, we start to see that direct primary spread throughout the United States. Now, also at the state level, we're going to have Teddy Roosevelt as the governor of New York. This is where his uh, political career and the attention really starts to get drawn to Roosevelt. He is a strong state governor, and you have to consider the state that he was governor of, given the time period and the goals of the progressive movement. New York was the center of that industrial uh, advancements in the United States. That's where we saw the cities growing at an increased rate, immigration increasing. We saw the conditions of uh, those cities being one that the people will try to call attention to. And Roosevelt is really going to try to tackle a lot of the issues within New York as governor. Uh, the, one of the first issues that he tackles is the hiring of state workers. He believed that these positions should be filled based on your merit, based on your record, based on your experience, rather than, oh, you knew someone, they became the governor, and they'll give you those state positions uh, just because of who you are. That's really going to anger a lot of people because not only is he cleaning up the political machines, but he's taking away power from some of those, poli those corrupt political parties. Teddy will also take on labor laws in the uh, state of New York, looking at working conditions, pay, and even considering the hours that workers were working. Uh, he directly confronts the political machine of Tammany Hall and Boss Tweed. He is going to start the park forestry program at the state level in New York, which travels through to his presidency that we'll see in the next section of the notes. Uh, the important thing to note here is as Teddy became this strong governor in New York, the attention was on him from big business. He will later get chosen and elected with uh, President McKinley. And the reason that he was chosen, even though he's this progressive New York uh, governor was so that business could big business could put him in a position where he lacked political power. McKinley was a supporter of industry and uh, a, he will be encouraged by the industrialists to choose Teddy Roosevelt to be the vice president, a position that really only has as much power as a president will give them. Uh, and, and that's an interesting selection there and we'll get into that more when we talk about the progressive presidents.
some societal reforms that we need to pay attention to. Uh, religion is going to uh, bleed its way into the discussion on reform. Uh, the reason that religion starts to be discussed and used as a uh, springboard here is Christian principles will be applied to improving society. This idea that we need to have the family together uh, and these Christian principles that were pushing and included in reform becomes known as the social gospel. Uh, some pieces of the social gospel, uh, ending child labor. Children shouldn't be in school. They should get the opportunity, or the children shouldn't be in the workplace. They should get the opportunity to be kids, uh, explore education. They, uh, this social gospel will push to shorten the work week. Uh, and really start to limit the power of big business by including the federal government in the regulation of these corporations and these trusts, these monopolies. Ultimately, the social gospel wanted to help the urban poor, these workers, uh, by expanding settlement houses around the country. I want you to take a listen here and the ideas that you are listening for is what brings attention to the child labor movement and make a connection. When has this happened before? What was the issue? How was attention drawn to it? What time period? Think of any connections you can make from what we've already learned about. The 1900 census reported that nearly 2 million children were working making up 6% of America's labor force. Children as young as five contributed wages to the family income. And many child laborers faced unhealthy or dangerous working conditions that often left them sick, injured, or deformed. Children were working in the fields, uh, and I'm talking about black children, white children, immigrant children, were working in cotton fields, in blueberry patches, in canning factories, in coal mines. They were sitting in coal shafts, controlling elevators for 12 hours a day at the age of 10 or 11. Progressive reformers became alarmed at the growing number of child workers. They formed organizations in the early 1900s devoted to the healthy development of children. One of those organizations, the National Child Labor Committee, hired Lewis Wicks Hine to photograph children at work and to expose their harsh conditions. Hines' images brought national attention to the difficult life of millions of children. Over the next 20 years, the NCLC and other organizations investigated child labor abuses and continued to push for state legislation that would take children out of the workforce and put them in schools. Finally, by 1929, every state had restrictions preventing children under 14 from working. But national legislation against child labor would take another decade because business and industry continued to oppose it. In fact, one of the major reasons that national legislation about child labor didn't make it past the Supreme Court until 1938, I mean, it's unbelievable to us that there was no federal legislation against child labor until almost 1940 was because essentially the southern cotton interests and midwestern coal iron steel interests combined to fight this legislation to stop child labor in 1938 president franklin d roosevelt signed the fair labor standards act which restricted child labor and continues to protect workers to this day Okay, turn and talk to your seat partner there for a second uh, and talk about what brought attention to this child labor movement and make a connection. When has this happened before? What was the issue? What drew attention to it? What time period are we talking?
Okay, hopefully in your discussion you talked about how the photographs and the writings drew attention to the child labor movement, getting people to see the conditions that children were facing. Uh, we talked about this with the muckrakers, Jacob Reese, drawing attention to the urban slums and the conditions that people were living in during the uh, with how the other half lives. Uh, there are some other connections that maybe you had made, but the photographs, again, going to be at the forefront there. So when we talk child labor laws, a lot of the child labor reform is going to take place at the state level before it takes place at the uh, federal level. Uh, when we talk about child labor reforms, school wasn't really something that you see like we do today. There wasn't an attendance policy until much later, uh, th and that opened the, av the ability for students to uh, work in the factories. Primary school was often about how far they got, uh, and then once they were old enough to really get into the factories, they did. Uh, eventually what we're going to see is states themselves will start to push for education reform which required students to be in school and the attendance policy will change. You also are going to see as immigrants came to the United States, a lot of immigrants coming here had the mindset of, okay, well, we worked either on the farm or in the city that we were in and in the country that we came from, so the children can work here. And it just kind of transferred over. So child labor was uh, familiar to immigrants that were coming to the United States. One of the first attempts at getting rid of child labor was the Keatings Owens Act in 1916. It was said to be unconstitutional by the state of South Carolina because it overstepped the bounds of the federal government regulating interstate commerce. Uh, and it, as you saw in the video there, you're going to have industry and agriculture team up to keep child labor. So when the Keatings Owens Act was uh, attempted to be passed, proposed, the, you have the state of South Carolina, the agricultural industry saying, no, we need child labor still. We have to continue this. It won't be until 1938, post Great Depression, that we see the Fair Labor Standards Act, which sets a lot of the uh, regulations that you see today. The Fair, Sta Fair Labor Standards Act also set the national minimum wage. It set the maximum hours for workers. Uh, then over time comes into play. Um, it, but during the Great Depression, there really was this lull in arguing for the, the uh, regulation of child labor because families needed it. If you had children, they had to go to work so that you could make a living as a family. And then once we see the Great Depression or the economy start to level off, we have uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act being passed. Some other pieces of reform that I want to make sure we pay attention to, there are four constitutional amendments that are included here with the, um, with the progressive movement. The first two are political amendments. The 16th Amendment establishes the federal income tax. If we go all the way back to the populist movement that proposed this graduated income tax, now we see in the progressive movement it being added to the Constitution. This ensured that people were paying their fair share of taxes. The 17th Amendment, another political amendment, also comes from the Populist Party. This ensured that the direct election of U.S. Senators would be uh, conducted throughout the United States. Instead of being chosen by members in the state legislature, the population within that state would directly elect their uh, U.S. Senators. So again, going back to that direct uh, democracy idea of the Populist Party, seeing it come to fruition in the 17th Amendment. Now we have a couple more uh, amendments here. I'm going to address the 19th and then go backwards. The 19th Amendment will be passed in 1920. This is going to be the Women's Suffrage Amendment, awarding women the right to vote. Uh, and that is considered a social amendment, although you could put it as a political amendment as well. 
The 18th Amendment is usually the one that we uh, remember most often. The 18th Amendment is going to be the amendment that prevents the excessive abuse of alcohol, and it is known as prohibition. Now, I want you to take a listen here about prohibition because it is going to be known as one of the biggest failures of the U.S. government. So I want you to take a listen for what was the problem? Is it a civic or constitutional issue? What is the public's opinion on this problem? What was the government's solution? And was the solution effective? And think about why it wasn't effective. And you guys are going to turn and talk after this for a couple minutes to run through these questions. Take a listen. On January 17, 1920, six armed men robbed a Chicago freight train, but it wasn't money they were after. Less than one hour after spirits had become illegal throughout the United States, the robbers made off with thousands of dollars worth of whiskey. It was a first taste of the unintended consequences of prohibition. The nationwide ban on the production and sale of alcohol in the United States came on the heels of a similar ban in Russia that started as a wartime measure during World War I. But the view in the Western world of alcohol as a primary cause of social ills was much older. It first gained traction during the Industrial Revolution as new populations of workers poured into cities and men gathered in saloons to drink. By the 19th century, anti-drinking groups called temperance movements began to appear in the United States and parts of Europe. Temperance groups believed that alcohol was the fundamental driver behind problems like poverty and domestic violence and set out to convince governments of this. While some simply advocated moderate drinking, many believed alcohol should be banned entirely. These movements drew support from broad sectors of society Women's organizations were active participants from the beginning, arguing that alcohol made men neglect their families and abuse their wives. Religious authorities, especially Protestants, denounced alcohol as leading to temptation and sin. Progressive labor activists believed alcohol consumption harmed workers' ability to organize. Governments weren't strangers to the idea of prohibition either. In the United States and Canada, white settlers introduced hard liquors like rum to native communities, then blamed alcohol for disrupting these communities, though there were many other destructive aspects of their interactions. The American and Canadian governments banned the sale of alcohol to native populations and on-reservation land. American temperance movements gained their first victories at the state and local levels, with Maine and several other states banning the sale and production of liquor in the 1850s. In 1919, the 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution banned the manufacture, sale, and transportation of all alcoholic beverages. The amendment took effect a year later under the Volstead Act. Since the act did not ban personal consumption, wealthy people took the opportunity to stock up while restaurants and bars rushed to sell their remaining supply. Workers lost their jobs as distilleries, breweries, and wineries closed down. Meanwhile, organized crime groups rushed to meet the demand for alcohol, establishing a lucrative black market in producing, smuggling, and selling illicit liquor. Often they worked side by side with corrupt policemen and government officials, even bombing the 1928 primary election for Illinois state attorney in support of a particular political faction. Tens of thousands of illegal bars, known as speakeasies, began serving alcohol. They ranged from dingy basement bars to elaborate dance halls. People could also make alcohol at home for their own consumption or obtain it legally with a doctor's prescription or for religious purposes. To prevent industrial alcohol from being consumed, the government required manufacturers to add harmful chemicals, leading to thousands of poisoning deaths. We don't know exactly how much people were drinking during Prohibition because illegal alcohol wasn't regulated or taxed. But by the late 1920s, it was clear that Prohibition had not brought the social improvements it had promised. Instead, it contributed to political corruption and organized crime and was flouted by millions of citizens. At 
one raid on a Detroit beer hall, the local sheriff, mayor, and a congressman were arrested for drinking. With the start of the Great Depression in 1929, the government sorely needed the tax revenue from alcohol sales and believed that lifting prohibition would stimulate the economy. In 1933, Congress passed the 21st Amendment, repealing the 18th, the only amendment to be fully repealed. Members of the temperance movements believed that alcohol was the root of society's problems, but the reality is more complicated. And while banning it completely didn't work, the health and social impacts of alcohol remain concerns today. One of the main tools that allowed the black market and organized crime to thrive was money laundering. Watch this video to learn how criminals used small businesses to keep their money clean. Okay. I want you to take a second and talk about the questions that you see here. What was the problem? What is the public's opinion? Was the go what was the government's solution? And was the solution effective? I'll give you guys about a minute and a half here to talk through what you saw in the video. All right, hopefully we got to, this is both a civic and a constitutional problem, uh, talking about the regulation of a societal issue through a constitutional amendment. Uh, the public didn't really uh, appreciate the government attempting to do that. Uh, the government passed a very strong amendment attempting to monitor the actions of the people, and ultimately it's gonna prove to be ineffective and just bad for society. Uh, we saw organized crime come out of this. You heard them talk about money laundering. Uh, it, it's really ultimately going to hurt society more than it helps it. And we'll revisit that idea tomorrow at the beginning of class. Some other pieces of progressive legislation that I want to make sure we highlight here. These I would say if you were highlighting, starring, whatever it might be in your notes to let you know that something is important, these next two slides are big ones. Okay, The Pendleton Act, also known as the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act, is going to be passed in 1883, really the beginning of this progressive movement. And what it does is it attempts to... Uh, clean up the positions that were being awarded in the government just based on who you knew. This goes all the way back to the spoil system with Andrew Jackson and just giving away these positions to people who helped you get elected or just to people that you knew. What the Pendleton Act does is it establishes that positions within the federal government are going to be awarded based on merit, meaning your experience and your background, rather than political affiliation, really going after that uh, spoil system. The next one, the Meat Inspection Act, is going to be passed in 1906. Uh, the Meat Inspection Act is a direct impact of the jungle. Once the jungle was written, you are going to see the government doesn't have a choice but to take action because the people are going to be up in arms. They now are reading about how awful the meat packing industry was, that meat trust in, uh, in Chicago, and they want a change. 
The Meat Inspection Act is going to require that there is federal inspection of meat sold across state lines and that there is a requirement for inspection of the meat processing plants, which seems like you would uh, you would think that this was just happening and it was common sense, but it was not. And we know that these meat packing plants were getting around the issue. Uh, I want to take a look at this political cartoon here. You can see in the back it says potted poison, uh, chemical corn beef, uh, bob veal chicken, tuberculosis, uh, petrified pork, deodorized ham. None of these things uh, should be really eaten by people. Uh, embalmment sausages, reference decayed roast beef. Really referencing the people that are included in here, uh, those human appendages that may have ended up in some of the canned meat. Uh, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, saying that <laughs> we really should pay attention to it instead of not paying attention to it. That political cartoon there may or may not show up somewhere in the future. Other pieces of progressive legislation that will be passed as a direct impact of the progressive movement. The Federal Reserve Act. The Federal Reserve is going to look to the banks and reserve funds. Uh, The Federal Reserve Act had the impact of regulating the money supply. Really trying to prevent inflation, but also trying to regulate the banks that had become a monopoly of a sorts here. Uh, This is a demonstration of the government getting more hands-on as well in the banking industry. The Federal Trade Commissions Act is going to establish the Federal Trade Commission. This is going to look to how trade was being conducted across the United States, and it's looking to monitor business practices. No longer is it going to be that these big monopolistic industries can prevent other smaller businesses from participating in this trade. This is the government's way of regulating those monopolistic trusts that were halting competition in the way that they know how because remember the federal government has the ability to regulate interstate commerce that trade across the nation and this is the way to do it and finally we have the clayton antitrust act that is going to be passed in 1914 the goal of the clayton antitrust act was to strengthen previous legislation that previous legislation being the sherman antitrust act the clayton antitrust act also uh, includes uh, these uh, protections for unions um, going after a time where unions were really being deconstructed by these big businesses, the Clayton Antitrust Act is going to give a voice and some more power to union workers in that way. When we compare and contrast the Clayton Antitrust Act to the Sherman Antitrust Act, the Clayton Antitrust Act is going to actually be able to bust up the trust, which was the goal of the Sherman Antitrust Act. The Clayton Antitrust Act is specific. It outlines what monopolistic practices are illegal, and it can be used effectively in the courts where the previous legislation had not been able to be used. All right, in an effort to keep this under 30 minutes, I am going to let you uh, stop here. We'll pick back up and finish this section tomorrow and get into the progressive presidents. Remember that you have your journal due this week. You have the documents due uh, this Friday. I would get ahead on the documents now. It will ultimately help you with the direction that we go in for the notes tomorrow and Wednesday.